Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's really lovely to see you here. You are welcome to God's house, and uh, I want to thank you all for being here this morning to worship and to glorify our great God. He is worthy of all our praises. It's always a joy to come into his presence together as his people and to uh, fellowship together. David, in his psalm, Psalm 59, verse 16, he enjoins us to worship uh, from these words which says, But I will sing of your power. Yes, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning. For you have been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. Amen. Amen. So we'll take uh, our song sheet and sing before the throne of God above. Before the throne of God above. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is David on his hands, my name is written on his heart, I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can beat me then steep heart, no tongue can beat me then steep heart. He sends me to despair and tells me of the Bibles for the public reading of scripture and open to Psalm 86. Psalm 86. It is a prayer of David, and it is a prayer for mercy, with reflections on the excellencies of the Lord. Bow down your ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy, preserve my soul, for I am holy, you are my God. Save your servants who trust in you. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I cry to you all day long. Rejoice the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon you, for you will answer me. 
Among the gods there is none like you, O Lord. Nor are there any works like your works. All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. And I will glorify your name forevermore. For great is your mercy toward me. And you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O God, the proud have risen against me. And the mob of violent men have sought my life. And have not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. O turn to me and have mercy on me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your handmaiden. Show me a sign for good that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed. Because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Amen. 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 We'll bow our heads uh, for prayers as I call Gary to kindly take the opening prayers for us. Thank you, Gary. Let's come to the prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we have read and sung this morning because it reminds us that there is an intimate relationship between us and yourself. And we are always amazed at this when we consider this, when we remember that you are the great and most high God, the one who has made all things with the word of the power, uh, the one who brought all things into being and through whom all things consist. Uh, we, wait, we wait to a new day because you uh, cause the sun to rise. And we are always grateful and uh, thankful for your faithfulness. Mm. Lord, we know that we are often unfaithful, unthankful and forgetful, mm. but you never, uh, never change. And we thank you for the psalm that we've just read when uh, David, a man who was often in trouble, uh, and this psalm is uh, unusually called a prayer rather than a song, and we can imagine him on his knees praying this prayer. Mm. And Lord, we thank you that we too can pray on our knees like this, that you would come to us and that you would help us. Mm. We thank you, Lord, that in this world of sin and uh, disappointment and sadness, that you are the God who never changes. You are the God who is there for us. And we remember that lovely picture of the prodigal son when the father runs to the son. You, Lord, care for us. You run to us and you look after us. And we thank you this morning. For whatever our situation may be, however our week has been or our life is right now, we thank you that we can come to you and you are the God of all comfort. You are the God who knows all things. Mm. We thank you then, Lord, that we have the freedom to meet like this. We thank you for the desire to meet like this. We Mm. thank you that the Holy Spirit has come to us and caused us to uh, be born again, that we understand now the things that we never understood, Mm. that uh, truly the Lord Jesus is your Son, sent into the world to be our Saviour. And we need him because we are sinners. Mm. And we thank you that he is the one who saves us from our sins, but he is the only one that can save us from our sins. Mm. And we thank you this morning that the offer is uh, to all, that whosoever will may come, that whoever believes on the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. Yes, Lord. That those who um, believe in their hearts that God has raised him from the dead. Lord, we believe these things mm. uh, because you have convinced us of them. And we thank you this morning that we are here to say thank you to you. Mm. Uh, you are a great and mighty God. Lord, we confess all too often that we are not as we should be. We once again come before you to confess our sins. Mm. We remember Nehemiah's words from last Sunday night when he said, I have sinned in my father's house. Mm. Lord, that's always true. But we come to you again to ask that you would forgive us and cleanse us for our sins of this week. Lord, forgive us for those selfish uh, times that we have let you down. 
mm. where we have thought about ourselves and not about you, not about other people. Mm. We pray that you forgive us for the words that we've said which have not been edifying words, for the thoughts that we have thought that have not pleased you. Mm. Lord, we pray, have mercy upon us again. We thank you for the promise that uh, we read in, in John's letter where he says that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness mm. on the condition that we confess our sins. And Lord, we confess them before you now. We ask in the quietness of our hearts that you would forgive us and cleanse us once again. And so, Heavenly Father, this morning we thank you that we have this opportunity. We pray for Elijah as he opens up your word. Help us, Lord, to understand the things that we read. Uh, we know that this is a book which uh, needs for the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to see. And so we ask this morning that you would speak to each and every one. Lord, uh, some have had great weeks, some have had difficult weeks, some of us are struggling with all sorts of things. But Lord, your word is enough for all of us. And so we pray that as it is read and taught that you would help both speaker and hearer alike. Amen. And so, Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of your goodness to us. We pray, Lord, for our country. We uh, see that once again we are in the midst of conflict and even as we speak there are uh, bombs and missiles being sent from our own armed forces and Lord we, we worry about these things. Mm. Where would it lead to? But Lord we pray that you would grant our leaders great wisdom uh, and we pray that you would help them as they seek to govern, that they would seek their wisdom from you. Mm. And Lord we would even ask that you would overrule all things for good, that they are almost as it were forced to pass laws that are good laws. Mm. We, we see that there is so much uh, out there, Lord, which is sinful and wrong. We pray for our country. We pray mm. that you would send revival to our nation. Mm. Pray for our city, that you would send revival here also. We pray for all the churches this morning that are meeting uh, to faithfully worship you and to preach your word. Mm. Lord, bless them, we pray. Mm -hmm. May the, the word go forth with power of the Holy Spirit. Mm. May <coughs> men and women, young and old, be saved this morning in this great city of ours. So, Lord, we, we ask our God, we thank you once again that you are able to do abundantly above all that we ask or even imagine. Mm. And so we leave our prayers and our worship and our thanks at your feet. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Amen. Glory to God. Okay, let us take our hymn books this time and turn to 400. 400. Uh, we sing, Nera, my God, to thee. From the redemption hymnal, 400, nearer my God to thee.
Adrian now to take our children's talk for us. Thank you, Adrian. Okay, well, good morning, young people. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> young at heart. That's encouraging anyway. <laughs> okay, I've changed the names. I've had to change the names of this story because this is a schoolboy story, so I've had to change the name... Uh, because I haven't got their permission, but uh, I think we'll be okay. Okay, so it's not about, it's not who you know, all right? It's not who you know, all right? Now, at primary school, there was a, na- there was a guy called Stephen, and he faced a huge dilemma, all right? To be popular with the in-crowd terms, or to be popular on his own terms, all right? I'm sure we've all faced that a long life's journey. But Stephen believed, he had a faith, he believed in God, and his faith was important to him, all right? But he didn't want to compromise it, all right? He didn't want to have it threatened, in other words, okay? He wanted to stay faithful to the God whom he believed, all right? The Lord Jesus Christ. But at the same time, he just wanted to be everyone's friend. And, uh, you know, like he said, I just wanted to get along with everybody. And I guess we all do, don't we? At school, we just want to get along (coughs) with everybody and do the best we can. So he decided to live what he believed in. And he hoped that people would like him, all right, and get along with him. You know, but this wasn't easy, all right? This wasn't easy for Stephen. Uh, Stephen loved his music, and when he got to secondary school, okay, he loved to play guitars with some of his friends. But one day, so, uh, but one day they suddenly decided to get up and go. They didn't want to be his friend no more, and they wanted to join up with the sports crowd, all right? They wanted to put their interest in their sports and be part of that, all right? But Stephen stayed with his music. Uh, so his so-called friends that he thought he had, all right, and they just wanted to be a part of the cool sports groups, all right, that everybody wanted to be friends with, all right? Now, I'm sure we might have come across things like that. But Stephen said that when he saw the split happening, that, he, that, that it really bothered him. It really bothered him. And it didn't seem right to him that he couldn't be, you know, they just couldn't be friends with him just because they had different interests in life. We all have different interests, but they just went off and left him and wanted to be friends with other people. All right? So Stephen challenged the system. He said, right, he challenged the system. He continued to be himself and to not give away anything of his faith, all right, and to pursue his interest in music, which was his gift and his talent, even if it made him unpopular all right he tried to be the best christian he could be and he treated the people the same no matter what group they were connected with which kept him alone some of the time as well which wasn't very nice for him but that's what he had to go through all right but by the end by the end of his secondary school days people started actually recognizing him uh, and what is Stephen had actually done all right so even his classmates, at the end of his school days, they voted to give him the highest honours possible, all right, at the school, all right? Now Stephen thinks, Stephen thinks he got the awards not so much for himself, but as a representative of, of, of a group of people who said, we are going to stand up for what is good and what is right, all right? Stephen had proved, Stephen had proved that it's not who you know, but who you are that matters, all right? It's not who you know, it's who you are that matters, all right? Most of all. And in our service today, we might possibly be reminded of God is faithful, especially in the times when someone has to make a hard choice to be faithful in serving God, like Stephen had to in his schoolyard, all right? In the Bible, don't we? We see many people like this, don't we? We see people like Moses and Joseph, and Daniel, who had to have go through lots of hazardous and hard times, all right, 
But the key thing is they stayed faithful to God right to the end. And that's so important. And we must be so thankful that God loved us so much. And we, he loved us so much that he gave his son, the Lord Jesus, to save us from our sins. Was he faithful? Was God faithful? I think yes. Yes, he was, doesn't he? Even he went to the cross and there to die for each one of us. That if we repent, have faith, and we believe in him, all right, we would have life too. Like Stephen, who saw it right through to the end of his school days, that we can be truly thankful to Jesus that he saw his mission to the end. Now, incredibly enough, uh, this is why I've changed the name, Stephen even went on in a, a year called 1990, that's a long way away now, that 1990, all right? He became the Gospel Music Association's Artist of the Year, all right? Okay, because he used his gifts and his talents that God had given him and he stayed faithful to his Lord. You know, and I guess some of his friends had judged Stephen wrongly, all right, and wished they'd probably have stayed with him, okay? And so, young people, I just urge you to be faithful right where you are, at primary school, at secondary school, or at college, wherever you happen to be, you know, it's not going to be easy. It won't be easy for us, is it? We will be tempted, might we? Okay? We will probably, uh, you know, people will probably get onto us and say horrible things, but we must stay faithful to God to the end. So if we, like Stephen, if you commit to God, he has promised to be faithful and to see you through. Now here's a promise for you this morning, young people, I just wanted to try and hold on to. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 9. It says this, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. And guess what? That's for you, that's for me, that's for all of us here today, isn't it? Stephen stayed faithful to God, all right? and kept his love and his commandments. And I want you to try and do the same, young people. And God has promised to be faithful to you no matter what situation you have to face, all right? Now, that might even seem really foolish to your friends around you. They might want to know what on earth are you doing, all right? Might be foolish, but the thing is, you'll receive. You'll receive the honour, like Stephen, for being faithful to Jesus right where you are. So whether at primary school, secondary school, college, whatever situation you are, be like Stephen and see it through. Stay faithful to God and he will stay faithful to you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Adrian. <coughs> Can please, please turn our Bibles to um, Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. Uh, we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We have been looking at Paul's first letter to the church uh, in Corinth, and today, by the grace of God, we will be going over chapter 4 and I have given the title Evaluating Christ's Servants Evaluating Christ's uh, Servants we find Paul in this uh, chapter pressing further in addressing the issues in the Corinthian church a church that he founded uh, through the preaching of the gospel a church that was endowed with spiritual uh, gifts and truly blessed uh, and yet lived sinfully due to worldly wisdom, which brought pride. They forgot uh, that foundation, which was Christ and his gospel. Uh, they were blinded to their ways, which weren't right. Uh, they had uh, the wrong evaluation of their leaders, and yet they were Christ's. They belonged to him. That's what Paul mentioned to them in that last verse of chapter 3. So in chapter 4, Paul is writing uh, to clarify as well as uh, qualify the servants of God. He makes several arguments towards this end as well as appeals to the people of God. 
Uh, I pray that the Lord will speak to our hearts uh, through uh, the teaching in this passage of Scripture and we would learn uh, from the Word of God. So I begin reading from uh, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it is a very little thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself. Yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time. Until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. For who makes you differ from another? What do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You are already full. You are already rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish you did reign, that we also might reign with you. I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death. We have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to man. We are fools for Christ's sake, that you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, <coughs> and we are dishonored. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. We labor, walking with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the field of the world, your scoff scoffering of all things until now. I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Now some are puffed up, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord wills, and I will know, not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. The kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod? Or in love, in a spirit of gentleness? Amen. Before we come back uh, to hear God's word from this passage of scripture, let us uh, take our hymn sheet and sing, Speak, O Lord. Ah, 
thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity. Cause our faith to rise, cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority. Words of power that can never fail, let the truth prevail over unbelief. Speak, O oh Lord, and renew our minds, help us grasp the heights of your plan for us. Truths unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity. And by grace we'll stand on your promises and by faith we'll walk as you walk with us. Speak, O oh Lord, to your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. Spirit of the Word, we ask that you come and aid us in this hour. You know the weakness of the preacher. You know how we struggle, especially with your Word. Open our hearts. Give us ears that hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the churches. Pray that you bless your Word to us and change us for your glory. Hear our prayers now. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but um, you know there are certain passages of scriptures when you come to you, uh, I struggle with. Uh, this is one of them uh, for me. And this passage of scripture speaks uh, to the preacher as much as it speaks uh, to the people. It is a word for both members and ministers, ultimately calling us to follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus in faithful, humble, and parental love like service. And I will mention that all these uh, flow uh, from our devotion to Christ and as we grow in our intimacy with Him. This is the pattern uh, Paul shows us in this chapter in evaluating the life of the servants of Christ. Observe, uh, uh, firstly, they are faithful servants. They are faithful servants. Think of us, says Paul in verse 1, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. You see, the people of God had their evaluation about uh, their leaders. They believed some were outstanding and others were not good enough. They used all kinds of uh, criteria to evaluate their leaders. And uh, they broke into groups. They were divided, preferring one leader over the next. They evaluated them according to their own standard. But here is God's standard. They are ministers of Christ, servants of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God, who are faithful. The word used there for servant is not a doulos, which is commonly used uh, for the word servant in the New Testament. Doulos actually means slave. Every servant of Christ is his slave. They have no right. They do what they do because uh, Christ owns them and necessity is laid upon them. But this is not doulos that is used here, but uh, who peritus, who peritus, which is used for an underrower. An under rower, so one who rows in the lower part of a ship, an under rower. 
They are serving under the captain of the ship, the Lord Jesus. And they are striving together with him uh, to safely get the ship to port. The ship is the church of Jesus Christ and the port is heaven. Another word to, uh, that is used to emphasize uh, the role of these servants uh, is uh, stewards we find there. Meaning a person entrusted with the responsibility of his master's entire household. All that the master had was placed in their care. Like a manager, they uh, would oversee uh, the properties of the master, his lands, his uh, fields, his crops, finances, and in some cases, even the master's children. Uh, these servants are the apostles, the ones who are called and sent by Christ. They are stewards of the mysteries of God, we read there. That is his divine revelation that was previously hidden, but is now revealed in Christ. Managers of God's truth, dispensers of it, as well as defenders of it. That is why we stand for the truth and we speak it in love. It is the greatest good that you can ever do to the human soul. What? To tell them the truth. Which is God's word. Stewards are required to be faithful. Faithfulness equates to success for them. And it doesn't mean uh, they are uh, infallible. Or without scrutiny. It simply means that they are accountable to God for their stewardship. They are answerable to their master. Who called and commissioned them. It is a great responsibility. That's what Paul means there. From verses. Uh, 3. Uh, to 4. Their estimation of him. Or his esp estimation of himself. Was irrelevant. That wasn't the point. The main thing is God's own estimation. And his final verdict. Concerning their lives. Therefore, it mentions in verse 5, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. That is at the judgment seat of Christ, where everything that is hidden as far as it's not just our deeds, our motives. Many times we see the performance and the appearance. God doesn't judge like we judge. He sees the heart. He sees the motives. Observe secondly, that servants and stewards of Christ are also fools for Christ. They are fools for Christ. Paul has been saying these things regarding himself, Apollos, Peter, and all these leaders the people of God are clamoring around. They are cooperatives, <laughs> stewards, servants doing the most menial work, managing the responsibility that has been given to them of overseeing God's house, managing His word. Safeguarding the truth of scripture. Dispensing it. You can always trust them to dispense God's word. They don't play with it. They do favor to your souls. Defending it. Earnestly contending for it. And Paul is saying, verse 6. I have used these illustrations regarding us for your sakes. That you may learn by us. All, all that he was saying about uh, the servants, uh, uh, the stewards. He's using all these illustrations. Speaking in figurative, figurative terms. He says for the sake of the people of God. So that they might learn by them. Not to think beyond what's written in scriptures. 
having the wrong view of these leaders. That none of you may be puffed up, filled with pride, taking side against the order. That's what they were doing. I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am of Peter. I am of Christ. Division. Confusion. All because of pride. All this comes from worldly wisdom which views and evaluates things differently from the way God does. And it always blows you up. That's what pride does. It, bl- it blows you up and makes you divisive. But the love of God, it builds you up and maintains the unity of the Spirit and through the humility of Christ. Pride always blinds and brings about self-deception. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. You realize that it's all of God. Not necessarily these leaders. They are just instrument that God is using. If you uh, took a pencil and you, you, you created a very beautiful uh, work of art. And someone comes and takes the pencil and says, Oh, this wonderful pencil and this glorious pencil. You feel like the person is out of their mind. No. You say to the person who did the work that that was a great piece of artwork that you did. God is the one using all these ministers as pencils and creating this great work of art. We give all the glory to God. It's all of him and none of us. Verse 7, that's where Paul is heading to with his uh, 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 rhetorical uh, questions. Number one, what makes you differ from another? <coughs> it is God that makes the difference. And it's all because of his free grace. So there is no reason for you to be proud. Number two, and what do you have that you did not receive? A man can receive nothing except it comes from above. God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. So there is no reason for you to be proud. Number three, now if you did indeed receive it from God, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Why do you boast as if... It was by your own knowledge or power. There is no basis for this self-boasting which is driven by pride. And then from verse 8 onwards the apostle uses irony to warn them. You appear to possess it all. And it's amusing that we don't. As Morgan writes concerning this verse, Paul is laughing at them with holy laughter and yet with utter contempt for what they have been doing. How I wish you were actually reigning that we might reign with you as well. It's nine, for I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. We are fools for Christ's sake. God has made them this spectacle to the world. What a contrast to what he mentioned in verse 8. In the place of being full, rich and reigning as kings, the servants of Christ were on display as the embodiment of humiliation in the sight of the world, both to angels and to men. The servants of Christ are showcased by God as the lowest of the low. It reminds you of Philippians 2, where you see the humility of Christ. You witness the condescending of the Son of God, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a slave, doulos, with no right, Jehovah's property, Jehovah's slave. He said, I'm coming in the likeness of man. And being found in the appearance as a man. This, is, this was a very great humility. So when he became as a man, he became a slave. And being found in the likeness of a man, he humbled himself further and became obedient to the point of death as a criminal. 
even the death of the cross is shameful that he was scourged. Go and read about the Roman scourging. Go and read about it. You can have a study on it and see what he went through. His back was like a field that had been plowed. He was crucified naked like a notorious a criminal. It wasn't done behind closed doors. It was done upon a hill to make public examples of what happened to the enemies of Rome. And after he died, as if that was not enough, they pierced him in the side. You see the humiliation of the Son of God. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless, and we labor walking with our own hands. Being rivaled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. <laughs> that is difficult. It is challenging for ministers of Christ in this day and age. It's not easy to respond graciously. I don't, I don't even need to go into details. It's all for the glory of God. Sometimes I just think myself and a thought comes to me that that's part of the calling. That's part of the package. It all comes with the calling of a pastor. Get all those emails. Bless them. The intimate knowledge of Christ should transform us. That's where we draw strength from. Abiding in Him. And what an encouragement for us, ministers, to keep going. We are fools for Christ's sake. We have been made as the filth of the world, the scum of all things until now. Who want, who want to have them as pastors? What a serious disgust to the Corinthian Christians who were spiritual elites. Hope I said that right. I'm still learning to speak English. You know, I was at work one time and I said, Oh, you know this thing? And the man said, It is not thin, it is thin. I said, Oh, sorry. African, you know, sometimes the things come out somehow, but as long as you know what I'm saying. <laughs> this was repulsive to their pride. We don't understand this kind of people. We, uh, we do not know what they are doing. They are ashamed of Paul because of his low and foolish state. Pastor John MacArthur comments on that word, of scoring or scum. <coughs> Figuratively, it is used as the lowest, most degraded criminals who were often sacrificed in pagan ceremonies. That's how these apostles were viewed, but that wasn't how they were viewed in God's sight. It wasn't the sight of the world. <coughs> in the world, Paul and his fellow Preachers, that's how they were designated. Servants of Christ are faithful. They are fools for Christ. And lastly, we observe their fatherly counsel. We observe their fatherly counsel from verse 14. Paul had been saying all these things in his letter not to make the Corinthians in Corinth ashamed. That wasn't his aim. But to admonish them as his beloved children. That's what he says in verse 14. He calls them beloved children. And there we see Paul's affectionate heart. He loved and cared for them. They were not thorns in his flesh. He had personal struggles to deal with. They were jewels in his crown. He loved them enough not to see them go down that drain 
of pride. Verse 15, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. This was their foundation. That is how they got to where uh, uh, they were as far as being in the church of God. It was through the gospel. How we forget where, when we first met the Lord. That humble beginning. When we first got saved. At some point we feel that we have arrived in the Christian faith. We are now spiritual. Same word used for instructors. There. In verse 15. Is used for schoolmaster. In Galatians 3.25. Where it mentions the law was a schoolmaster. To bring us to Christ. And Paul is using this illustration. Between uh, the instructors. Thousands of them. And the father. He's, he's using that illustration to make a point. You have the instructors. Uh, with the law. The law was a schoolmaster. Was an instructor to bring us to Christ. These are those who use the law to instruct us. To bring us to Christ. Like in the ancient Greek and Roman world. Schoolboys were entrusted to trustworthy slaves. Who were charged with the duty of supervising their lives and morals. Until they reached manhood. They were always with these boys. When they went out and went anywhere. They observed and they made sure they were living rightly. They were doing the right thing. Instructing them. To lead them the right, to, down the right way to do right. It's good. But it's not powerful enough to change them. I was on the street recently. And I saw some people. They were uh, preaching and. So you need to do this. You need to do that. You need to do this. I, said, oh, no. I can't. I can't. I need him. The law is good. What a wonderful work it does in showing the sinners uh, the darkness of sin and the fire of God's righteous wrath against it. But what a breath of fresh air is the gospel when it comes. That this very fire of God's righteous indignation concerning sin has passed over me because of his son. And that God now smiles on me and bids me to come into his presence and his kingdom. What a contract. You have many instructors in Christ. Yet you do not have many fathers. Paul begot them through the gospel. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Paul reminds them again. Not just of himself as their spiritual father. But of their foundation which is the gospel of Christ. Which made them the people of God. Which got them an inheritance among the saints in light. Those who weren't the people who were without God in this world. Through the gospel they became founded in God and reconciled to him. How soon we forget this foundation of Christ. How often we leave our first love. We leave Christ and start pursuing spirituality. Our own agenda. Remember what the Lord Jesus said to the church in Ephesus. It was a loveless church. Paul founded a church in Ephesus. And he wrote, it, he wrote the greatest uh, treatise on love. 1 Corinthians 13. John the beloved himself. The disciple whom the Lord loved. He became the bishop of Ephesus. And Christ says to this church in Revelation 2. I know your works. Your labor. Your patience. That you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have, you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. And you found them liars. And have persevered and have patience. And have labored for my name's sake. And have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. How did this church end up loveless? They have left Christ. They are soon removed from the simplicity that is in Christ. The gospel was their foundation. But somehow, they shoved it aside and started pursuing other things. Your first love isn't works. It is a person. You have left the simple trust and belief you once had in Jesus. Therefore, I urge you, says Paul. Verse 16. Imitate me. Paul is leading them back to Christ. This is what he said in 
uh, in chapter 11, verse 1, he said, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Christ was the final end. Christ was his goal, not himself. Christ is our ultimate example. And we must constantly aspire, aspire to be conformed to his image. We must constantly challenge each other to this end. We must continue to see something of Christ, especially in the leaders in God's house. And we must follow them to the extent that they follow Christ. Hear the voice of the good shepherd through the mouth of his under shepherds. And follow him, follow Christ. But run on the voice of the stranger. Run. Verse 17 as we conclude. You see the paternal heart of Paul. He goes further. I would, he would not only give them a fatherly counsel. He would also send Timothy to encourage and strengthen them. Timothy was the one that is always there in all the struggled churches. He was there in Ephesus as well. Now Paul is going to send him to them. He said, his beloved and faithful son and the Lord. What endearing words. What does Paul say there? Say, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church? That's, that's what it meant when he says, imitate me. He is not saying, uh, do as I say. And then he goes and leaves anyhow. This is what the Pharisee says. And that's why Christ says, listen to what they do, but don't do what they do. Because they say the right things and they do the wrong things. He attacked them severely, calling them hypocrites. Brood of vipers. Paul wasn't just teaching doctrines. He was living the life of Christ and then teaching this. All life flows from the vine. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Paul has spiritual authority. And there are those who are proud because they think that he wasn't going to come to the church in Corinth. Again, we see his fatherly care as he threatens to pop their spiritual balloons through discipline. Threatens to come with a rod. Church discipline is an important aspect in the life of a church where sin is confronted and corrected. It's Safeguards what is pure, what is good and true. Where sin is left unchecked, these things are threatened. Paul will come to them if the Lord wills, and he will find out if there is spiritual power behind their words or their boasting is empty. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power, it is not in lip service but in the power of a godly life. Paul doesn't make an empty threat. And he leaves the ball in their court, asking them how they would like him uh, to come with a rod of correction, which was actually used by shepherds to smack disobedient sheep. That's what that word means there. Rod. Or do you want me to come in love and a spirit with gentleness? One form of correction is to be excommunicated and that's what you will see when we go into the next chapter uh, chapter 5 when we come there Christ says to the church in Laodicea the lukewarm church which locked him outside as many as I love I rebuke and chasten therefore be zealous and repent behold I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door. I will come in. And dine with him. And he with me. May the Lord help us. With these words which we have heard today. So that we can go back. And examine our ways. And repent where needs be. As well as pray for the grace. To help us change. For the glory of God. Amen. 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 Let's uh, sing what gift of grace. From our song sheet. Lord, through the grace of Christ.
your hands. Lord, bless us as we gather to have fellowship around the meal, Lord. Let it be meaningful, Lord, and let it be a wonderful time, Lord. And so we thank you once again for all that uh, you do for us, Lord. We give you all the glory and praise. Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, may make his face to shine upon you and be gracious <coughs> to you. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his perfect peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.